Each year, Microsoft Research hosts hundreds of influential speakers from around the world, including leading scientists, renowned experts in technology, book authors, and leading academics, and makes videos of these lectures freely available. Normally we're about 10 to 15 minutes late. Today we'll, we'll try to only be five minutes late. Um, since I see a, new, uh, a whole bunch of new faces here of uh, uh, people who may be new to this event, uh, my name is Michael Gammon. I work in the NLP group here in, in Microsoft Research. Uh, this is the eighth event in a series. Um, so it's actually the third year that we're, we're doing this uh, once a quarter, and it's, it's just fantastic to see that it's still going and that there's you know, ever more people actually coming and always new faces. Um, first of all, I want to thank uh, you know, some people who helped put this together and, and organize this. So there's from the SNL group, my colleagues, uh, James Lyle, Eric Beck, Thierry Fontenelle, and uh, Kumiko Kato. Um, as far as organizational things go, I hope you all registered your cars if you're in a visitor parking. If not, then run <laughs> and do it quickly before it gets towed. If you, um, I mean, I, I don't know how, how much you are familiar with the terrible commute from here, but basically since we're going to, I'm, I'm sure we're going to run over time a little bit. So, you know, if you're leaving here at about 5.30, you might as well take a nap for an hour. You're not going to get over to Seattle any sooner. Um, so I have a list of restaurants here, actually. There's a quite, quite a few uh, uh, interesting, small, um, diverse places uh, around here. Uh, so if you prefer to, to have dinner than being stuck on 5.20, um, there's a list here. Um, I'll probably put that over there on the counter. Help yourselves to that. So we have, uh, we have two talks today, uh, Manuela, Noska, and Will Lewis, uh, um, in the opposite order of what we had on the, on the sheet, um, to make it more interesting. Uh, we also have a bunch of demos afterwards. And then um, uh, there's a table over there with information material. There's actually a job opening. And there's also uh, lots of possibilities for internships. Um, so, you know, make sure you check that out. There's flyers, information material. Um, that could be pretty interesting. So, yeah, so the two talks that we have today. First, uh, Manuela is going to be uh, um, up here. Uh, she got her PhD from the University of Chicago, and she's uh, been with Microsoft how, how long now? Uh, I forgot. Six and a half years. Six, six and a half years. Um, and then the last couple of years or so, she's been working on this uh, project on unsupervised acquisition of Hadesa morphology. And this is uh, a pretty admirable piece of work, especially since it's, it's been done you know, on top of a full-time job and a, and a full-time family. So, <laughs> um, After that, uh, Will Lewis, who is uh, assistant professor at the University of Washington, will talk. Um, sorry, it's the title is Locating, Recognizing, and Converting Interlinear Text on the Web. Um, Will got his PhD in 2002 at the University of Arizona under Terry Langendern. And uh, during his graduate student work he, there, he worked on the, um, the email project, which is Electronic Metastructure of Endangered Languages Data. And uh, the Odin project, which is actually he's, he's going to mention in his talk, is sort of work that emerged from, from that uh, project. Um, yeah, and as I said, you know, the format is We'll have the two talks, roughly, you know, 25 minutes per talk plus questions, um, and then we'll we'll do a little break, this refreshments, and uh, then we're just going to mill around, see the, the different demos, and uh, hope you all um, take the opportunity to make contacts and just chat with a lot of people. Okay, thank you, and go ahead, Maria. Okay, so I'm going to lead this afternoon off with a few remarks on the two presentations that you're about to hear. Um, while it may not be immediately apparent from the abstracts that you've read, um, both lines of research are inspired by a common desire, namely to make information about underdocumented languages available in an electronic format uh, so that this information can be shared by other researchers as well as by communities of people who speak those languages. Can you hear me okay? Okay. Over the fa uh, five uh, years, over pa the, fa the past five years, much effort has been put into defining discipline-wide standards for encoding linguistic data and sharing data on the web. The data includes everything from references about language data to field notes, texts, visual images, video films, and sound recordings. And uh, as Michael has just mentioned, much of this effort is driven by email, which stands for the Electronic Metastructure of Endangered Languages Data effort. 
Emailed is hosted jointly by Wayne State and Eastern Michigan University, the University of Arizona, um, the Linguistic Data Consortium, and the Endangered Language Fund. And email is funded by the NSF. Uh, the work we're just going to talk about deals with identifying interlinear gloss text on the internet and received some initial funding from emailed. And the work that I have done on documenting the Atesto language is inspired by the emailed initiative in that it, uh, all the documentation adheres to the best practices that have been uh, defined by emailed. And so this is just sort of to pull those two things together. Uh, both talks are somewhat practically oriented and we hope that you will enjoy them. Um, so let me turn to my own paper now. Um, the work I'm going to talk about today is part of a larger body of work on documenting the Ateso language that I have been engaged in over the last two years. Ateso is a little-known Nilotic language that is spoken mostly in Uganda. The goal of this project is to build a lexicon and a morphology for Ateso and eventually, many years down the road, write a grammar for Ateso, but that is what at Microsoft we call a stretch goal at this point. After I had assembled what I thought was a decent-sized corpus for TESO, I began using the unsupervised learning algorithm known as Linguistica in the hope that it would speed up the process of creating a lexicon by providing me with a list of stems and affixes that would become lexical entries. Um, I have to say at this point that the project has neither been a great success nor a complete failure. In fact, the data I will share with you will show that the results are right in the middle and hard for us to interpret. But I will talk about the reasons why that is as well. In this talk, I'm going to present some quantitative data on how well Linguistica does in identifying suffix boundaries in TESO. The results were obtained by comparing the Linguistica output for some 300 words with the morphological gold standard for these words. The gold standard is based on a manual, manual analysis of these words and was established with the help of a native speaker linguist, namely Laura Otala, at the University of Namibia. And Laura and I are collaborating on the do documentation of this language. Beyond the quantitative results, I will also share some insights about the process and the corpus with you that may be of importance to other researchers who are planning to undertake this type of work for languages that are becoming available on the internet. And I should not forget to move my slides forward as I talk. So these are the goals, share the linguistic experience that I've gathered, reporting on the quantitative data, and ultimately the goal of the whole project is to develop a data-driven morphology for TESO. The structure of the talk is as follows. I will first explain uh, briefly what Linguistica is. I will then provide some background on the language and the corpus that I've been using. Next, I will talk about taste orthography and, and its morphology before describing the experiment itself and presenting the results. So Linguistica is an algorithm for the unsupervised learning of the morphology of a natural language. It was developed by John Goldsmith at the University of Chicago and is available as an executable at the uh, URL that's on this slide here. I will only give a brief overview of Linguistica here and refer you to Goldsmith 2001 for a technical discussion of Linguistica and a description of the heuristics that it employs. Uh, I know that John gave a talk about Linguistica here many years ago that many of you have probably attended and the slides from that talk are on his website so you can always go there as well if you want to just get an overview of that. Uh, I know that you all know what unsupervised acquisition of morphology is but I will define it anyway. Uh, what this refers to is the discovery of stems and affixes and by extension the location of morpheme boundaries from texts that do not contain any information about the lexical categories of their words or their internal structure or their meaning. Linguistica accomplishes this goal by dividing the discovery process into a set of heuristics which guide the segmentation process and a minimum description length model, MDL for short, uh, which uh, evaluates the outcome. In essence, MDL assumes that the goodness of the morphology is measured by its compactness and that we can measure the compactness of the morphology in information theoretic bits. Linguistica generates three pieces of information about the morphology of a language, a list of stems, a list of affixes, and a list of signatures. A signature is a list of all suffixes or prefixes that appear in a given text with a particular set of stems. So let's look at the examples on this slide here. Let's assume that we have all of these words and no others in our corpus. Then Linguistica would generate the following output. It would identify a list of five stems, a list of three suffixes, 
and a list of two signatures, namely a signature that contains the verbal suffixes s, ing, ed, as well as null, and a signature that, contain, that consists of the two suffixes null and s. So each stem in a text has a unique signature, and the signatures tell us what affixes a, gi um, a given stem in a given corpus occurs with. Okay, that's all I'm going to say about linguistica, and I'm now going to talk about the language itself a little bit. So as I mentioned, a linguist, uh, Teso is um, a Eastern Nilotic language, so it belongs to the Nilo-Saharan language family. There's about a million speakers in Uganda and another 300,000 speakers in Kenya. Um, Teso is, or the Te Teso are the second largest ethnic group in Uganda, and that makes a Teso the second most important language in that country as well. Uh, this slide just simply shows you the five districts in Uganda in which Teso is spoken. Um, and uh, Soroti, Kumi, Katakwi, Kabaramaido are all contiguous, they're all next to each other. Tororo, the one at the very end, sort of sticks out a little bit. It is not, there's like a corridor of Bantu languages in between. So there are a couple of different dialects of Teso. I really don't understand yet what distinguishes them, but the Tororo dialect certainly stands apart from the other dialects. And then I didn't have any uh, information or uh, geographical information or a slide, I should say, about where the language is spoken in Kenya. But with only 300,000 speakers, uh, Teso is a minority among minority languages in Kenya and really doesn't center in that country at all. Um, I also feel like I need to say something about the state of documentation for this language. Um, there's a short grama by Hilders and Lawrence that was originally published in 1956 and that was recently, in fact last year, reprinted and so is uh, more publicly or more widely available mostly to people in the UK, however, because most people in Uganda cannot afford to buy their grammar. Uh, Hilders and Lawrence also put out a short dictionary of the Teso language that I have worked with, but by far the most valuable source on this language is a fairly extensive Teso English, English Teso, Teso dictionary that was published in 1953 by Father Kigan. Unfortunately, Kigan does not adhere to the standard orthography of Teso, so you need to sort of be a little flexible when you look up words in that dictionary. Uh, beyond these scholarly works, there's a couple of other publications in this language. Uh, most notably, there is a Bible translation. The full Bible has been translated uh, by the United Bible Societies in 1961. The various primers from the 50s, a few other publications that have come up more recently. And then there's also a newspaper, a weekly paper in Ateso. Uh, that is called the top. It is uh, actually uh, owned and run by the New Vision, which is the uh, leading newspaper in Uganda. It's government owned, it's supposed to be independent. Uh, 5,000 uh, copies of it are printed every week, but the readership is probably more 100,000 people because that's just the way things are. Papers get spread from one family to the next, to neighbors and friends, and so on. So it has a fairly wide distribution. And the, the most recent development is that uh, this newspaper Etop is actually now being published online. In fact, publication online started back in 2001. So for the last almost five years, um, this paper has been available online at the URL that's on the screen here. And I also actually at this point do want to mention that I have done field research on Teso in 1988. So it's uh, almost 20 years ago now and collected some texts and other recordings. And, and those are the only field notes that I'm aware of anybody possesses. Um, let's talk about the corpus now. Uh, the corpus, um, at the point when I did this research, uh, totaled 460,000 alphanumeric tokens. And that boils down to roughly 46,000 different word forms or types. The corpus consists of two parts. The first and the biggest part um, is the newspaper corpus. Those are 414,000 tokens, roughly. And the second smaller part are the four Gospels of the New Testament from the 1961 Bible edition, and that is a to total of 53,000 tokens. Of the total of 46,000 word forms or types, 5,500 occur only in the New Testament, 37,000 roughly occur only in the newspaper corpus, and about 3,000 word forms um, occur both in the newspaper and in the New Testament, which means that of all the word forms in the, in the New Testament, only about a third are also found in the modern-day newspaper corpus. Isn't 
inflection important in those? That is, that, that if you were more generous and now you define a type, would you get higher matches? I don't think so, but there's a reason why the matches are as they are, and I'll, I'll come back to that in, in, in fact, just a moment. Uh, let's just briefly talk about the orthography of this language. Uh, the rules of the orthography were published in 1961. Uh, Tessa uses the standard Roman alphabet, uh, but unfortunately tone, which is grammatically relevant, is not marked in the writing system, and neither are differences in uh, tongue root advancement. Tongue root advancement is distinctive in Tessa. It actually has nine distinctive vowels, but only five are written. And uh, these both decisions are unfortunate because it means that uh, tasal words in isolation are highly ambiguous. They can have many different meanings. And the ambiguity was such that when I first worked with Laura on trying to identify morpheme boundaries in our set of words, I gave her the words in isolation and she got back to me about a week or two later saying, this is almost impossible for me to do. I don't know really what these words mean. And I had to give her the sentence context for her to be able to make sense of the words and assign morpheme boundaries. And that is far from ideal. Ideally, you would have wanted to be able to identify the morphine boundaries in isolation and maybe come up with you know, all the possible breakdowns, but we weren't able to do that, so we had to use sentence context to identify meaning and then identify the morphine boundaries only for the words whose meanings we were sure of. Okay, I'm now going to turn, and that goes, sort of goes back to your question, to, to the most difficult topic um, of this whole work, and that is uh, Teso, at least the newspaper corpus, is, I call it, and it's a euphemism, of course, rich in spelling variants. Um, these variants, I want to say right away, are a huge problem because they obscure morphological generalizations and they contribute to the high number of spurious suffixes and signatures that Linguistica ultimately identifies. Um, in defense of the people who write in that newspaper, I have to say that, you know, this is a society that has only been writing for about 40 years now, not much longer than that. Teso is only taught in primary school. And on top of that, there are really no dictionaries available to people that they could use to look up how you spell a word. So basically, for many cases, it really just isn't known how you spell something, and people make up spellings as they go along. Um, there are two types of spelling variants. Did you have a question, or, sorry? Okay. There are two types of spelling variants that I think we need to distinguish here, and one is spelling variants where there really is no standardized form, and that is the example that you see on the slide here right now. Uh, this is actually a loan word from Swahili, and uh, I have found these two variants, Eserikali, soldiers, in both the New Testament and in the newspaper corpus, but then the second form, Eserikali, uh, that is only found in the newspaper corpus. What this means, and there are many other forms of spelling this, this is just one example to show you, uh, what this means is that there's a lot of variation in the newspaper. There is no variation in the New Testament. So as a corpus, the New Testament itself is much more coherent. They really have stuck to one particular way of writing things. But in the newspaper, that is not the case, and that's where a lot of variation comes from in this corpus. Um, and here I have one example, however, where the spelling variation is not due to an absence of any standard but what we're dealing with here are mostly really typos. And uh, this is one of the names of one of the districts in which Tesa is spoken, Cabrera Maido, 344 occurrences in the corpus. And there's a second form, Cabrera Maido, 26 occurrences that may be a local variant, I don't know, but everything below that is just clearly typos that have not been taken care of. And as I already mentioned, this, this is really an enormous issue, and I, f I feel somewhat sheepish standing here and talking about this now, because it does feel like it, it devaluates a lot of the work that I have done, but I have to say that I was actually not aware of this issue until I had a critical mass of words to be able to say there's something funny going on in this corpus here. So it only after I looked at words, basically what I do is I filter for stems, and then I find I have 50, 60 variants or stems or forms based on a word like by that I actually realized this can, even in a language that is highly inflecting, this cannot be all the possible inflected forms of a word like by. And so, so this is a problem, and uh, I, w I'm going to have to deal with this. Um, I can certainly uh, try and use string added distance to sort of come up with clustering of, of words and see which ones really are the valid ones, which are the non-valid ones. I don't think I can do that fully automatically. I can certainly sort of do a semi-automatic process of trying to throw out the, the forms which I believe are wrong forms or typos. 
Um, but I also have to say that this is a process I can mostly only do for nouns because the verb morphology of Teso is still so unknown to me and it's, it's, a, it's a language where you can stick four or five different inflectional forms or suffixes on a verb stem that I'm going to be, have to be very, very careful before I attempt to clean this up to be sure that I actually know what the morphology allows and what it does not allow. So this is somewhat of a problem, but uh, I'm going to have to deal with that. Okay, let's just quickly talk about TESA morphology. Uh, TESA uses prefixes and suffixes as well as a limited set of infixes in its morphology. It is mildly agglutinating, maybe that's an understatement. It is definitely more agglutinating than English. It is not as agglutinating as Swahili, for instance. It distinguishes two genders on nouns through prefixation, and it has a rich nominal mark number marking system. That's something I'm going to talk about in a second. What I want to talk about uh, at the moment here are the examples that you have at the bottom of the slide. Um, in masculine nouns, prefixes mark both gender and number, and in feminine nouns, we have only one prefix, namely the prefix a, um, that occurs both in the singular and in the plural. So if you uh, are dealing with these two words here and you want to identify the morpheme boundaries, uh, let's say for the word aquap, aquapin, and you want to start at the end of the word to identify the suffixes first, it's easy enough to find or identify the in as an ending because the strings, the segments that precede, are the same in both cases. Okay, so it's easy enough to figure out in is an ending. For the second case, itau, itau, itawan, heart, that is not so simple because if you want to chop off the on ending, you're not finding anything before the on ending that is the same because the prefix varies. Now, if you try to do the opposite and you begin at the front of the word, try to identify the prefix, you're going to have the mirror image problem. Namely, you cannot identify either E or I as the prefix because the segments that follow these prefixes are different. And um, this is a problem and one uh, that I believe uh, John is now looking into. Um, but this pattern of, of variation is really not that rare in the languages of the world, and it's a pattern that linguistica right now cannot really deal with very well. So this is something that, uh, where the model is really failing, where the model needs to be improved. This slide here simply shows you nine ways of forming uh, plur the plurals, or sometimes uh, you can also mark singular in teso. I haven't counted all the different ways in which you can uh, mark number on nouns in this language. Um, I believe there's at least 40, if not 50 different ways. It is not predictable how a given noun will form the plural, so we need to assume that uh, number marking in teso is lexical and live with it. But I'm showing you this mostly because this is one of the reasons why one of the reasons why linguistica is finding as many suffixes as it is is because there's some, in some areas there really are this many suffixes. So not everything that linguistica suggests or proposes is rubbish. Some of it is indeed based on the language and the facts of the language. Uh, I'm not going to talk about verb derivation. I just want to show you these here. These are verbs that we have analyzed um, and just give you a visual impression of what a verb uh, looks like in TESO. Uh, the fourth example here, you can see gilem is the, uh, is the root or the stem, and there is four different, uh, two derivational suffixes and two inflectional suffixes ended on. So it's a fairly agglutinating language. And the morphology of the word so far, I frankly have very little insight into. So that's definitely an area for further investigation. OK, let's turn to the evaluation now. Um, so I tokenized the entire corpus. and. Uh, created a list of the different types and tracked the frequency with which each word occurs in the corpus. And I did that mostly because there was a small tokenization bug in Linguistica and I didn't want to have to deal with that. So I have tokenized first and then read the list of 46,000 word forms into Linguistica. Um, and I uh, executed two commands, namely the suffixes run all, uh, command followed by outer layering. And everything I did really was focused towards suffixes. I'm not going to, I didn't evaluate the prefixes, and I'm not going to talk about prefixes right now. Um, of the 46,000 word forms, 39,000 forms are analyzed. So 85% so, um, of all word forms are assumed to contain a suffix in this language, and that's fairly high. Uh, Linguistica identifies uh, to a total of four layers of suffixes. It identifies 650 distinct suffixes, and lo and behold, 4,590 signatures. And I don't know if you have looked at results for English or French, but these are all fairly high results. And it's the first indication that something is not going quite right with the, with the analysis. 
here is a list of the top 12 signatures in this language. And again, I don't know if you've looked at English or French or Spanish results, but one thing that is striking is that all of these signatures are fairly short. Ideally, what we would want to see here is list of suffixes that can occur with a given stem. But that is not happening. Instead, all of the topmost signatures in this language are short. They have either one or two suffixes in them and no more. There are the sort of characteristic longer uh, the signatures as well in this language, but we don't have many stems that actually occur with them. And I'm going to skip this one and just look at this one. This is, I think, the third uh, most important uh, signature in this language. Uh, the signature is null and n. So essentially what this says is there is a variation in this language here between stems uh, that occur on their own and stems that are followed by n. And the two uh, first examples here are on here mostly for your entertainment, quite correctly. It has analyzed Ethiopia and Ethiopian belong to this group. And Nigeria and Nigerian belong to the signature, because those are the two forms that do indeed occur as with null, so no suffix and the n suffix. And then we have a couple of, I have a couple of tasteful words on here. They are all correct. All of these are correctly assigned to this particular signature here. And the O in examples three and four are uh, allocative prefixes. Um, OK, so to evaluate the output of Linguistica, I took three sets of 100, 100 random words each from the list of word types. And I marked the stem and suffix boundaries for each word uh, in the evaluation set, for each valid word, I should say, in the evaluation set. And then I had Laura review uh, the in initial analysis that I came up, that I came up with. In cases where I wasn't able to come up with an analysis because I didn't know what the word was, I had her do it right away. And then we declared the expected results as golden upon review by her and then further review by me. So that's how we established our golden set. We then compared the linguistica suffixation output with a gold standard, calculated a score for each word, taking the word's frequency into account, and then we calculated precision and recall for each set and then averaged uh, over all three sets. And again, we completely uh, ignored the prefixation results. Um, now, the decision that we were going to use, the frequency of each word in the evaluation was one that was done before I ran the experiment. And I did that because I didn't want to be influenced in the evaluation procedure by the results. So I had sort of made up my mind I was going to use frequency uh, in the evaluation. I'm not sure that was really the right decision um, because I'm not sure it really adds anything. So I keep on saying I was, I think, wearing my industry hat a little too much when I suggested that. I think that for the purpose of evaluating this algorithm, I don't think that you need to have frequency. Um, but the results I'm going to show you um, actually are going to involve the frequency of a word. And I've, uh, in the last couple of days, sat down and also recalculated everything, leaving frequency out. And so I'm going to present you two metrics, one where we take the frequency of the word in the corpus into account, and one where I don't. Uh, of the words in the evaluation set, I need to say a word here. Um, uh, we had, so these words were, the words were randomly picked. And uh, from each word contained, each set contained a certain amount of garbage. So, and a certain amount of words that I felt I needed to throw out for the evaluation purposes. Namely, all proper nouns were thrown out. All acronyms I had to throw out. All unincorporated English loan words, like carrots and channels and mobilization, I decided to throw out because they weren't really adding anything to, to the evaluation. Then all misspellings had to be thrown out. And then all nonsense words had to be thrown out. In, unfortunately, when I was done with all the throwing out, I had thrown out about 30% of the words in each set. So the set was getting smaller and smaller. Uh, I had initially wanted to evaluate 500 words. Then Laura and I decided that that was going to be too many and be, be sort of focused on 300. And then our 300 ultimately boiled down to 200 words that we really could use. It's a very, very small set to be working with. Um, Here's just a couple of examples of words that have a very straightforward morphological analysis, nothing much to sort of worry or think about. And uh, here are a couple of examples where we are unsure and where we remain unsure. And for all cases for which we are unsure, we essentially decided not to use them in our evaluation because they weren't going to add any value to us. As I mentioned earlier, we then calculated precision and recall for precision. Um, I took um, all of the suffix words, all words in the corpus, or in the evaluation set, I should say, that have fu suffixes in them that linguistic analyzes and divided the number of correctly analyzed words by the words of, uh, by the number of suffix words in the evaluation set. And for recall, we took all I took all words in the set and uh, divided the number of correctly analyzed words by all the words in the set. 
And uh, here are the results for precision. Uh, so the first uh, examples here are the weighted ones. So these are the examples where I've taken the uh, frequency of the word into account and the uh, uh, numbers on the right-hand side are the non-weighted results. There's a huge difference in sample one. And the reason is that sample one contained the taste equivalent of the English word sad, S-A-I-D, which occurs almost 3,000 times. And because Linguistica gets that right, the score went way up. And that was the, one of the reasons why I decided that maybe frequency was not going to be the best thing to use in this study. But even if you leave that out, the precision for sample one was still 60%. And then as you can see for sample two, um, the weighted 68%, non-weighted 50%. And then for sample three, weighted 50%, non-weighted 58%. So the average was 72% precision if you take frequency into account, 56% if you don't. And for recall, again, uh, recall is high on the first sample because uh, of the one word that occurs frequently in the corpus. Uh, 91% if you take frequency into account, 49% if you don't. For sample two, only 34%, and uh, non-weighted 31%, and for sample three, 31, and non-weighted 53, and I cannot believe, but I did it. I have a copy and paste error in here. The average of the weighted score is not 72%, it's more like 50%. So I don't know how often you need to look at your slide to catch these things beforehand, but I made a mistake. Um, okay, so what's going on here? Or well, let's sort of talk about the, the, the takeaways. Quite clearly, these are, the, the results really are not ideal. I had wished for better results. One of the things that is going on is that Linguistica does overanalyze, and the recall numbers, I should go back to this, kind of speak to that, it overanalyzes. It finds more suffixes than there really are in the language. And the reason for that, on the one hand, is certainly all the different variants. There's a lot of noise in there, and it has to deal with the noise. And the way it does is by chopping just about everything off as a suffix. Um, but there's also a lot of legitimate variation, and uh, there's a lot of different inflected forms. Um, it is rich in inflection of morphology, and that is the reason why, um, why the results are what they are. Um, so what have I really gained from this study, I guess, is what the takeaways are all about. Um, First of all, the list of stems and suffixes and the signatures have been useful for me for discovering morphological generalizations, especially with regard to the ordering of suffixes. So you can come up with certain generalizations if you just look at, you know, this suffix is found, or these two suffixes are found with these stems here. You can come to certain insights about the morphology of the language. Uh, secondly, the lists have been useful for discovering parts of speech. So the um, this null and n uh, signature I showed you earlier, those are all nouns, and there are no verbs, no verbs that have that signature. So that gives you a pretty clear or one clue as to what nouns in this language are and what verbs in this language are. Um, the definitely the evaluation set needs to be increased. As I've said, it shrunk uh, over time, which was unfortunate, but we couldn't really change because we didn't have time to do more work on this. Um, I'm not sure frequency really belongs here. Um, I tried to factor it out and uh, get different results. And we certainly also need discipline-wide agreement on what types of data should be in the evaluation set and how to calculate precision and recall. So if you sort of get uh, go back to academia where you find that this type of work is being done, there isn't much agreement on, on how you really evaluate this. And I think that's something that even linguists need to get used to. There are certain standards and we need to sort of lay out and formulate of what we're going to be using in these evaluation sets and how we calculate recall and precision. Um, and then lastly, uh, the absence of a standard form of spelling really interferes with the goodness of linguistica results. Um, and this is certainly a problem not only for me, but I believe that uh, this is a problem for, for all linguists who are trying to deal with data that they find on the internet, certainly for languages that are underdocumented or not well known you're mostly, more very likely to find or run into the same kinds of issues that I have run into working with TESO. Cultures that don't have much of a tradition of writing will be very loose in how they actually spell. And if you're hoping to do or use that data for your research, um, you're going to have to figure out how to work with it. So I don't have a good answer to this at all, um, but I was hoping that I might get some input from you as to how to deal with the variation that I found in TESO so that I can sort of uh, continue with this work and, uh, and see if I can improve the results that I'm getting. And that is pretty much the end of the talk. Are we doing questions now? Or? Okay. Okay, so go ahead and ask questions. The thing that occurred to me about dealing with the spelling variability is, had you thought about um, using automatic clustering methods 
to to put the the words into clumps, like doing a string distance between all different words and trying to clump them together. Yeah, that that's that's what I will be trying next. Actually, I should mention that after I sort of realized this problem, I did try to uh, take care of the worst cases. I formulated a couple of regular expressions and just cleaned out the worst offending words, like. Uh, you know, using the phonotactics of taste, so, so anything like RT, for in instance, or TR is not permitted in this language, so I cleaned those out. And I reduced the corpus by about 3,000 words that way, um, and then re-ran the, uh, the entire experiment, but the results didn't change. So that wasn't enough yet, so I need to do more cleaning, and yes, string edit distance is going to be what I'm looking in at, what, what I will be looking at next. Some of your signatures had only a single non-null affix. Mm -hmm. And I was curious how Linguistica could, could find a single non-null affix as the entire signature. It seems that it would, it would either have null and an affix or, or two possible affixes. Well, uh, I need to think about that. But I think that's not, unco it's not uncommon. You're right. Yes, it has found that. Um, I need to think about why it's finding that. I haven't put that in doubt, actually. I need to look at the stems that it's proposing and then see how it's coming up with that. Yeah. Um, how did you, when you, when you got the data originally, the newspaper and Bible data, was it in electronic format? Or yes. did you have to scan it in? Or? Uh, the, no, the newspaper corpus is all electronic. So that was an electronic format. Uh, the, uh, the New Testament, I had to scan scanned it in and then had to do manual cleanup and then I have my data. Um, it, might be, uh, it might be interesting to look at with the newspaper data, it, it'd be interesting to, with the, the various spellings of things, it might be interesting to look at the byline if there is a byline and see if uh, different writers are consistent within their own writings of how they're spelling things. Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that would, it might be hard to detect that. I'm not sure how you would merge that data if you discover that one person is spelling it one way and another person is spelling it another way. Yeah, I could try and sort it out. I mean, I keep I keep all that information. I could try sort it out and you know organize it by by author and see if I find persons or people who are more guilty of misspelling than others and <laughs> and reduce my data set that way. Yeah. But it's also possible to associate with variations that this person is consistently spelling the words this way. Like with yes. I, to me, I used to work in a language with 5,300 people, so 1.3 million sounds like an unbelievably large. Mm -hmm. the community, mm -hmm. so down to have all sorts of variation like that. Yeah, there. Combined with. Yes. There's all kinds of things going on. I mean, I, I'm so thankful I have Laura because she looks at these data and she goes on tantrums when she sees it and she often says, I can't believe that these people are really tasteless speakers. They must be banter speakers who are pretending to be tasteless. So I don't know what's going on in, you know, in, in that area there. Um, uh, but yeah, I, all of these things still need to sort of be uncovered or understood. And that's, that's part of the work that is ahead of us. I, you said that maybe that John was looking into uh, dealing with the circumfix situations where you had a strong interaction between the prefix and, and the suffix. Uh, I mean, I, I, I see that as a circumfix sort of situation, or at least the paradigm tends to be matched on either side. Do you know if, uh, if, if he's trying any new algorithms in that direction, or if he's just looking to, if it's just going to use the same kinds of strategies of clustering? No, I think they're looking into changing the heuristics, the discovery procedures themselves. And in fact, I just got an email this morning from him saying, you know, I've got something here, but I didn't have time enough to even, you know, put this into this. But I think there are, so there's work that uh, he and Colin Sprague are doing on the Swahili morphology, where I think they are sort of dealing with similar issues. And, um, and so I believe they're changing the, uh, the heuristics themselves in order to take care of this. I think the English uh, spelling system was pretty unstable when the printing press first became a big deal. And the oh. different printing shops um, would sort of build a house style mm -hmm. of adding things like the silent E was introduced by one particular printing shop to distinguish, to make it seem more snooty than the other ones. Mm -hmm. And I think that Aronoff uh, did a study of this. Um, I mean, I, I, I'm not sure it ever got published, but I, I didn't see it at one point. It was, I mean, studying orthography is not quite legitimate, um, but it'd be interesting. I mean, in your case, it seems like the you don't have. I mean, your your data is all coming from one source. It's not where the two sources are competing with each other, trying to um, create a spelling system. Um, Webster uh, changed the English, the American spelling system, 
um, in order to sell uh, his uh, books on how to learn, uh, how to teach spelling and dictionaries. Um, and that's the reason we spell a bunch of words differently than the British do. It was all done for commercial reasons. I, I guess here it's just there's the pressures are so much different. But. Yeah. Yeah, it is, and you know, I've actually have more data at this point. I have uh, at least one other book that I scanned in, but quite frankly, the more and it's the real problem, the more data I add, the less consistency and the less coherence I seem to get. And so, adding data is not really going to solve my problem here. It is throwing. No, it'd be interesting if the spelling variations are random or if they're associated with, uh, um, you know, particular printing styles or. or Yep. Is this a directly phonological spelling system? I know English is not, but if this directly reflects the phonology, then it may also directly reflect dialect differences. Mm -hmm. Well, t to some extent it is, but it's not phonologic in the sense that it doesn't reflect tone and it doesn't distinguish the different tongue root differences in the language. So it, it, it really is not a direct phonolog phonological orthography. Yeah, my question kind of falls on kids. Uh, you, I wonder what, you said that this is all non-standard spelling. I wonder what kind of, of uh, normative standards, if any, there are for the language. Um, and the, the follow-up question to that is, is going through all of this giving you any ideas as how you might establish a normative standard for spelling? And that has to happen in the evolution of the language. Um, where does that stand right now? Well, there, so there is, there is a, a, a norm for the language that those are the rules of the Otiso orthography published in 1961. Um, I don't know that Otiso people have access to this. Uh, you know, this, this was all done in colonial times. I don't think that they really know. Um, the only efforts that I'm aware of for, for bringing more coherence to the writing system is there's supposed to be a conference that deals with the spelling of all these different minotic languages that I think is supposed to, it's supposed to take place in Uganda and involve the community. But this, isn't, this has been sort of publicized for over a year and it isn't getting off the ground. The question is what would need to happen for people to be more coherent in their own spelling. I think one thing that needs to happen is that they need to have more printed materials, that they need to, you know, not only a dictionary, but more printed materials that they can go to. Um, Laura was just back in Uganda, and I had asked her to you know, buy books if she sees any so we could use them, and she emailed back saying, I wasn't able to find a single book in this language in the Teso area. So. Um, it's, it's a conundrum, and what's, what's the conundrum is that on the one hand, Uganda is sort of, you know, or at least its leadership is visionary in trying to, you know, bring things online. I mean, they have an online newspaper. This is unheard of in most other African language, in different vernaculars of the country. And yet, the people themselves don't have a single book to go to and and and, and read, you know, and so hence don't know how to write their own language. I think what needs to happen is that, um, yeah, the community needs to get more involved and, uh, and become aware of this as a potential issue and. Uh, and basically make agreements on how they're going to spell things, create dictionaries that they have access to. That's, for a small African country, a lot to accomplish for one of the languages that is spoken in that country. So I hope that answers your question. I don't yeah, know I just would offer the, just the little anecdote that I work in a speech and natural language, and um, we just, in the last year, released a product for, for, for Nepali. And I heard anecdotally that uh, it was the first spelling checker for the language. It was a big, big deal. And that having access to that actually not only standardized the spelling when the people, the fact that it was in the software, but it increased the literacy rates mm -hmm. by an enormous rate, something like 8% to 52%, mm -hmm. because people were actually using it. And there's something about a spelling checker that will bring you to a standard faster than any printed right. book will. But who, who defines the standard? I mean, I can't do it. And they need to, so you can only write a spell check if you have an agreed upon spelling system and they don't have it. Actually, that's not entirely true. The spelling checkers on the web work pretty well um, for, you know, people's names and stuff that are not in. There's, mm -hmm. I mean, they basically just use the frequency counts in the web. And so everyone sort of votes on how it spells and it converges to the doctor's frequency quickly. But you need to have a more logical analysis. Spelling differences and which things are. Uh, yeah. 
you want to? Sorry, this okay. is obviously it. <coughs> really interesting questions, I think. Um, you should probably switch over to Will's talk so we don't run too far behind. But um, Manuel, you better leave, right? Uh, no, not yet. Okay. Um, so hopefully Manuela is going to be still available, you know, after the talk, and we can talk about it. Uh, you hooked up, right? Yeah. Is it true? We are uh, running a little bit late, uh, so I'll just talk very fast and then, uh, no, actually, I'll just go at my regular pace and hope uh, that we have enough time. Um, uh, my name is Will Lewis. I'm with the University of Washington. I'll be talking about uh, the, the title you see right here, uh, Move Forward. Um, these are the people that have helped me with this project over uh, the past few years, uh, and uh, you see the funding sources down there, too. This was actually directly funded by a, a BCS grant uh, from NSF, and then also email provided some of the initial funding for this work as well. And a, body, a, a large number of students have helped with this, some of whose names are actually up here. Um, so I'd like to start with uh, the uh, linguistics data on the web, and I'm speaking of uh, linguistic data that's uh, theoretical linguistic data, if you will, or language data that's used uh, within uh, uh, theoretical linguistics. I'm not talking so much about tree banks and uh, sources that are more focused on uh, computational concerns. I'm talking about specifically linguistically analyzed data that's uh, uh, traditionally analyzed. Um, there's a large amount of this actually making its way to the web. Uh, uh, linguistics has moved into the modern era uh, in a big way. Um, uh, but it's not easy to locate necessarily. So uh, there's a, a large number of papers, a large body of papers that are published on the web, but uh, it's very difficult oftentimes to find uh, specific language data um, uh, using existing search tools. Um, so search engines may locate these, but the results are often noisy and difficult to ferret through. And this is made even more difficult by the fact that there's no uh, consistent encoding standards within the field of linguistics. Uh, although emailed the project that uh, um, Manuela had uh, mentioned, the purpose of that project, uh, of that grant, was actually to develop these uh, encoding sources. So we're hoping that the uh, reason for this whole project will actually disappear um, sometime in the next few years. Um, so some of the data, uh, there's actually been some tools developed. OLAC is one of the tools for locating uh, linguistic uh, or language-centric data that's been linguistically analyzed, uh, the OLAC community. Um, and basically, OLAC provides uh, standard metadata and resource description methodologies. The problem is uh, it only finds registered resources. Um, so if you're not registered with OLAC, you won't be discovered. Uh, and in search by language, uh, it only provides links to resources. There's no data level search or display facility. Uh, OLAC is not widely adopted uh, because uh, registration process is fairly involved. And I also would claim that linguists are kind of taking, and resource providers are kind of taking a uh, wait and see approach. Uh, and it's actually, uh, it's fairly bad for OLAC at this point. Um, OLAC has 34 registered resources, which is fairly small. Some of these resources have a lot of data in them, but it's been 34. Uh, the resource I'm talking about here was registered a year ago, and that's resource number 34. So uh, it's been very slow, and we're hoping that uh, bringing online uh, web mining tools will actually help with, uh, with this. Um, so some of the problems is how to make the wealth of language data on the web easily locatable and how to provide search facility across and within these resources. Uh, so the solutions would be to adapt some of the technologies that are used frequently within uh, IR in the Compline communities, uh, extract and enrich and index these data that are discovered, and expose these data to uh, sophisticated services of various types, including smart search and uh, other types of like, uh, data comparators and that kind of thing. So ODIN is the project that uh, I'll be spending the rest of the time on. And ODIN stands for the Online Database of Interlinear Text. 
This is a pilot project uh, funded through an NSF Sugar. Um, re it's basically focused on resource discovery uh, for data formats that linguists typically develop. These include these, although we focus mostly, almost entirely, on interlinear forms. And I'll, if you're not familiar with what the interlinear form looks like, I'll give you an example here in a bit. Uh, so it's, uh, it discovers these data on the web, in, primarily in scholarly documents. And uh, these uh, data are then indexed by language and document URL currently, although the instances are actually preserved as well, curated uh, to facilitate other types of search in the future. So this is uh, just basically what interlinear looks like. For those of you who have not seen it before, most of you probably have. And these are the basic, uh, this is the basic three-line format that's used. These are often objects that are embedded within uh, scholarly papers. Um, um, and there's a large number of these papers now being published to the web, so there's actually a large body of these kinds of data available. Um, it's important to note that the first line is the transcription line. That is actually uh, uh, can be a misnomer because it can be uh, an orthographic form rather than a phonetic uh, transcription, so you'll see a mixture of different formats, and that's a little bit of a problem for capturing these data and, and using the data later. So. The, there's an inconsistency there. There's also inconsistencies within the uh, gloss line uh, too, although uh, there tend to be more standards in the way that people mark up their data using the gloss line. So the gloss line basically is your markup line. Um, and the translation, uh, surprisingly, is almost always English. Even if the paper is written in another language, it's almost always English. Um, Thus far, uh, Odin has discovered over 1,200 documents. Doesn't sound like a lot, but there are 22,000 instances of interlinear text across those documents that have been discovered, uh, 540 languages. Uh, it's searchable by language name on the Odin site uh, and also via OLAC. So we're registered with OLAC, so you can actually go to Linguist List or go to the LDC and, and find uh, 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 these data. So this is an example page. You'll note along uh, the left-hand side, uh, the language names, all 540 are listed there. We might have to change the way that's displayed. And then you also see the, um, the actual uh, URLs that uh, are linked uh, here. And then across uh, here, you have the number of instances of IGT that were discovered. And then the verification levels. And there are various verification levels for these data. Highest basically means that the data has come across completely, that there is no corruption in the data. It's been evaluated by a person. It's, uh, it's fine. It's, and then uh, the last column there, there's actually another column that's disappeared off here. There's a, a, a raw column, an XML column. Basically, these are columns where you can actually view the data. So if you click there, you can view it. The only reason all the data that are at the highest level don't show up that way is because we don't have full citations for those. And we felt that citations were uh, important uh, for fair use. If we're actually displaying uh, data from a document, we should at least be citing that document. So um, Odin basically crawls the web, um, looks for linguistics documents using a meta search, uh, um, so using other search engines, looks for IGT like uh, 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 data uh, string sequences using regexes, and extracts and parses these, stores them in a database. It's semi automated. Automated um, human review is a crucial part of the process. We want fully automated, and so we're actually working in that direction. I'll be talking about the fully automated process um, um, in the latter part of this talk. So basically, this is what it looks like. Locating these are instances within a document, page within a document. You don't have to read that, by the way. I'm just using this for illustrative uh, purposes. Uh, uh, they're extracted, they're stored, and then uh, indexed in the sense indexed by URL and language name. The recognition process, as I mentioned, uses regexes. These are templates that are stored in a text file, and these uh, they're e basically easy to edit. I won't go through. All of you in this audience probably know exactly what a regex would look like, so I won't go through what they look like. You can imagine what they would look like given the template that I showed you. Uh, so results using just regexes. How successful is a, a set of templates, uh, regex templates, for actually discovering IGT within documents? Um, so we took 50 randomly selected documents, uh, linguistic and non-linguistic, anything that was discovered. We took those 765 possible instances. The engine identified 646, 396 are correct. So we actually have pretty dismal uh, precision and recall just using the regexes. Um, we improved this uh, by using an alignment algorithm that throws out things that are not uh, rigidly aligned. So if we look here, we have uh, the same uh, example that I pointed out. And the alignment algorithm basically goes through and aligns the words and then attempts to align the, uh, 
the morphemes. And in this case, they don't align because the morpheme breaks are not consistent between the gloss and transcription lines. And this example, although it's a very, it's a fine example of IGT, gets thrown out. However, um, it does improve our precision rather dramatically by using this very rigid um, uh, alignment algorithm. It does destroy our recall, but we kind of felt the precision was much more important than this process. So we wanted to have IGT going into the database, not noise. So we wanted precision as high as we possibly get it and sacrifice recall. I'll talk a little bit more, uh, more about this problem in a second. Language identification is also critically important because you want to find it by language name, these particular instances. So uh, we basically, the first strategy we used was to identify the language names in the surrounding text. So within the body of text uh, for any given IGT example, there are language names, and we use the Ethnologue database to actually identify these names. Um, for those of you who are interested, I provide the website there. And Ethnologue is now at version 15. That just came out. And so here's an example of a document here. Um, and this is a, a document on West uh, Green, uh, Greenlandic. And you'll notice that there are two examples of IGT here. And basically, we identify West Greenlandic in the text preceding, it could be after as well, and we link it to these particular examples. And so that's actually how we then identify these as uh, West Greenlandic. Hey, Will. Yes? Uh, this example actually has Norwegian in the second line right after. Right. Would that also be identified? Uh, uh, it will actually, um, it gives priority to before rather than after. So it, it will actually, I think actually there are some Norwegian examples that follow in this particular document, and those were correctly identified as Norwegian. It's almost always before. If we don't see it before, then we check after. And then we, uh, we align. So yeah, we give uh, priority. In this case, there's, uh, there's no problem. There are cases where we have multiple names appearing. And then either they're aligned by number or it's not clear. And in that case, uh, we either don't uh, work with it or we uh, uh, use a technique where we try to choose uh, um, based on some sort of intelligent guess. Um, and so given our, our precision and recall from before, uh, uh, the language ID actually for those instances that are IGT, uh, we're getting about a 93% uh, accuracy rate. Now, uh, I'll integrate these results in just a second. The problem is, uh, even if we wanted to do this unsupervised, we want precise IGT recognition. We want accurate language ID. Precision of 88% uh, ensures that 12% of the data won't be IGT, and that's not good. Um, error rate of language ID uh, of 88, I mean of 93% uh, uh, success means that we have 6% error. It means that we'll have uh, misidentifications around 6%, which is also, I think, too, too high. So we want near 100%. So the real quandary that we had is how are we going to actually improve this? Well, the solution we came up with first was supervision. Full supervision, meaning that an army of grad students sit down and go through all of the results that come through ODIN. Um, and we actually did that. So for most of the year of 2005, a couple, it's not an army, but a small army, um, of grad students uh, reviewed all of the IGT that was actually recognized by ODIN and put into the database. Uh, it's very labor intensive, uh, but it's nearly 100% uh, precision in recall. So we like those statistics, although we can't do that for the long term. Um, however, what this did allow us, now that uh, by December 1st of last year, we had 18,000 instances of IGT verified and in ODIN. So they had the correct language names. There was a, a, a large body of data there that opened up other techniques then. Because we had this body of data and uh, across 450 languages, we opened the door to statistical techniques, basically uh, engram techniques over the uh, character sequences within the transcription lines. Uh, so there's enough data in ODIN um, to build 367 uh, language models. We're now at uh, 433. And pairing that, and most of these, by the way, I should point out, are uh, endangered or minority languages. Pairing that with the other technique actually gives us a pretty good uh, success rate. So here's some text again on West Greenlandic. Uh, so the suspected name is there. Uh, if you can't read it, it's West Greenlandic. Um, we look at the language, uh, the language line, the transcription line, build a small model over that, and then match it to the signatures we have in the database. 
this comes back with the two codes ESB or ESG. It's not sure which one. Well, ESG happens to match what we had seen in the text, and we accept it then. This actually gives us 99.5% accuracy. So we're assured that the language that we're getting is, in fact, Western Glendic in this case, or whatever language we happen to be looking at. For the 367 we had at the time, we're now up to 540 or whatever it is, and 430 of those we can actually uh, uh, read in automatically at this point. So our prior uh, results, uh, precision and recall, were here. Adding the new language identification heuristic, we actually get these precision and re, uh, this precision and recall, which I think is a lot better. The alignment algorithm still has a very poor recall, but the precision is at 98%, which I think is enough to put in an unsupervised mode. So we've actually been testing this in the past month. Uh, this is the week one, uh, the automated uh, resource uh, or IGT discovery. Uh, the error rate's actually a little higher than the statistics that I showed there in the sample. So uh, something's going awry here, and it's getting worse, um, progressively worse. So we're trying to figure out what exactly is happening. Part of it is I think we're saturating the, the search space a little bit, um, and we're getting more noise actually being introduced. The percentage of noise is going up because of that, and therefore it's lowering our, uh, our actual results. Um, so. The next steps, which we're working on right now, are uh, to reduce the ID errors because it looks like, actually, if we go back to this, the errors that we're getting most of the time here are not language identification errors, but actually errors in IGT identification. So we have to revisit the regular expressions and the whole engine that we're using for identifying IGT in the first place, improve that, and I think that's where we'll get improved results. So uh, we want to increase the recall also. Uh, so uh, part of this is more sophisticated uh, alignment algorithms between the transcription and gloss lines. We're also adopting methods for parsing the gloss and translation, uh, translation lines. The translation lines being in English are fairly easy to parse because there are off-the-shelf parsers for English. Aligning that with the gloss line then gives us additional information about the gloss line that we can then use to help with identifying uh, uh, tokens within the uh, language line, or the transcription line, excuse me. Um, and then changes in the language identification methodology, which I won't elaborate upon here. Um, we also want to move uh, beyond uh, language-centric search um, because uh, I think that we have enough data now that we can actually implement search strategies across uh, the instances. And I've talked to several linguists about what kinds of things they would want to look for if they, were, if they had a search engine to look through linguistic data, what would they look for? And so uh, some of this would involve looking for uh, specific uh, glosses or specific uh, grammatical concepts that are encoded within the second line, for instance, and then pairing that with like uh, co-occurrence between various kinds of glosses and that kind of thing. That's something that linguists would be interested in looking for. And so we're actually working on search engines to do that. And then also to compare. So compare between uh, instances between different languages and between analysis for analyses for the same language. It's important to recognize that not all linguists will agree on the analysis for a particular form, and then being able to compare those analyses would also be of interest. Uh, and then enrich these as well. And we're actually working on strategies for identifying morpheme types. IGT generally does not give you morpheme type, meaning suffix, prefix, this kind of thing, or uh, clitic, what have you. Those uh, can be discovered to a certain extent using some of these parsing strategies and then also using the parsing strategies to uh, intuit some uh, syntactic structure within uh, um, the data as well. So in summary, um, ODIN is a model for building automated dynamic resources from structured and semi-structured uh, data types for linguistics. This is common in other disciplines becoming more common in other disciplines especially, but not very common in linguistics, in the uh, traditional linguistics. Uh, adapt common technologies used in information retrieval and comp -ling. And ODIN uh, augments OLAC by locating current resources on the web rather, that don't have to necessarily be registered. And the methods can be used to build similar resources that contain language data for the other data types that we've talked about, so lexicons, word lists, this kind of thing. Uh, and complementary also with other large-scale linguistic resource discovery projects, including Langator, which is a project, a joint venture of Rosetta and the LDC, 
which is using techniques for data aggregation uh, to discover possible resources. And we've actually used some of their early uh, crawls to uh, uh, provide a source of data for Odin uh, at, um, about a year ago, and we're going to be looking at it some more. And this uh, particular Langator project is uh, currently pending funding uh, from the NSF. So um, I went very fast. <laughs> Actually, I have a little bit of time here, so I'm going to talk about a little bit some of the uh, 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 fun stuff that we're working on right now, uh, kind of the future directions. So for search, um, we're looking for uh, sophisticated search over the IGT data, and basically uh, uh, within the grams and glosses, so some level of concept search. This is um, uh, developed from the GOLD uh, project, which is the ontology for linguistics that's described in Ferrar 2003, and we have a document on the GOLD community practice uh, being, that's in submission. And then also search across phonological data, which we're not intending to do uh, anytime soon for reasons uh, I won't get into. Um, but basically our search interface right now, this is a very simple search interface, uh, but it normalizes uh, the terms, the glosses that are actually used within the second line. So um, it's important to recognize that although you might be clicking on ergative here and you want to find instances of ergative data across the data set, for instance, uh, if there are other ways of encoding ergative in the data that we've discovered, those are included in, that, in those results. So, for instance, perfective, there's no consistent way for marking the perfective uh, in uh, linguistic data, PERF, PFV, what have you. These are different um, uh, ways of marking it. All of those are actually normalized to one, one concept, uh, ergative, or I mean perfective uh, aspect in that particular case. And um, this is a list of languages uh, that, have, uh, that are in Odin currently that have ergative case as expressed as a suffix. Uh, now, uh, we don't, the data itself doesn't say that it's a suffix. We have to discover that it's a suffix. Uh, and then accusative case is a suffix also. So this is actually an interesting query to a linguist because what you're doing here is saying, give me the list of languages in Odin that are split ergative that have both the nominative accusative system as well as the ergative absolutive system. And uh, these are the results, uh, actually, by clicking on the one language there, Gar Garawa, uh, I can actually click on the data link and then list the instances that actually have ergative and uh, ergative accusative. Now, there's one actual spurious result here, the 10 there. We're still working on it. So something showed up that wasn't supposed to be there. Um, we're also looking at profile building. Uh, if you go back to the results screen here, uh, profiles are uh, basically grammar fragments for each of the different languages, and these are essentially inventories of aspects, uh, cases, etc., um, and then be able to search over these as well. And so this is an example of one that's encoded in XML that's, uh, that is open to search. Uh, if you notice that in this, this is for a gerbil, uh, at the very bottom there, there's actually uh, like non-future tense and unusual tenses that are actually expressed in this language that can be searched for as well. And then finally, knowledge discovery is uh, something we're working on um, because IGT is a very limited amount of linguistically analyzed data. There's a lot more uh, that's associated with each IGT instance that we're not discovering. And that happens to be in the, the document itself. So we're working on methods to actually collect some of that additional knowledge and associate it with each of the examples and then provide a search facility over those. And these are the languages, some of the languages that we built language models over and uh, references and that kind of thing. So anyway, that's it. Questions? Yeah. Yeah, so in regards to the, um, into the language identification, could you talk a little bit more about that? I'm, I'm curious to know if, if it would pick up like a document in Spanish that might have um, an English gloss mm. of what it with, like, or something. Okay. Yeah. Um, the uh, language identification algorithm uh, that's being used is a, just a fairly simple engram strategy that Kovner and Trankel developed, you know, 10, 10 plus years ago. Um, and it ranks. I mean, there's a, there's a there's a threshold that's set in there that ranks these. Now, your question was specifically, will it discover Spanish data in a? Well, like for example, you had. Greenlandic. Yeah, Westmoreland. Being found. So once you once you think you know what the language is, you try to find 
the name that name. okay so would you throw it out if you don't find the name or would you we uh, we don't uh, process it if we don't find the name we store it away and say this is it looks like it's interlinear let's come back to this later so we make a record that we found this but we don't do anything with it at that point because there's we have to have the name uh, in order to put it in the database. And is the name only in English? Uh, the name is generally in English. It's whatever the names are in the Ethnolog database. And the Ethnolog database has uh, six, some 6,000 plus languages and all their variants, all the uh, other names. So it's actually a database of some 40,000 records or something like that. Of all the variant names that are uh, available for that language, some of which are in other languages. So you'll find English, for instance, is represented as Inglés in some. So it would actually find that and associate it with, uh, with English. Um, we do uh, uh, have discovered uh, that most of the interlinear glosses that we find, even like in papers that are written in German, for instance, are actually uh, the inter interlinear of the translation line still in English. It's the most surprising thing. I thought for sure it would be in, in German, but it's not. In, uh, Spanish papers tend to have more Spanish glosses, but still a large number of those actually are in English. Um, I was wondering, you, you mentioned the difference between the orthography and the uh, uh, IPA uh, transcription. Uh, you didn't come back to that, and I'm wondering yeah. uh, how you deal with that. Uh, right now we're storing it. We're not providing search over, over the transcription line, so we're just preparing the results. So it hasn't been an, it hasn't been an issue. Um, the, uh, there are several problems there, actually, because uh, let, let me back up with one point that I kind of sidestepped. And most of the data that we're finding are embedded in linguistic documents. And most of these lingu linguistic documents are in PDF. PDF is a disastrous uh, format to work with. I mean, it's just terrible to work with. And so when we extract from PDF, we often suffer some degree of data loss. Now. Uh, it's actually not as high as I thought it was it was going to be. We actually ran some analyses on these, and we have the different verification levels. So if someone actually who has sat down and gone through to verify that we actually extracted it successfully, the highest level basically says it extracted completely. And then high is basically it extracted partially. We have part of it, but it's still a good example, so we'll put it in the database. Of those two, those are the two manual, you know, supervised uh, uh, verification levels. Of those two, 70% of them are actually coming across cleanly. Even from PDS, we're getting a large number of those. Of the 30% that are not coming across, many of those are in some sort of phonetic transcription like IPA, which we're losing some of the diacritics. So oftentimes, they're just a diacritic or two that are missing, and we're not getting the rest of it. So how will we normalize across those? Uh, that's a good question. It's something that uh, I gave a reference on here. Ed Garrett's been dealing with as far as another search tool for normalizing across different uh, transcription technologies. If it's an orthography, that's a much different. I, I think that would be very difficult to normalize across. But if there are different transcription strategies, I mean uh, uh, standards, those would be easier to normalize across. Uh, I can't say more than that because we really haven't explored it. Um, I think there was a question over here first. Emily, sorry. I'm curious, uh, you've been working mostly from documents that you can find on the web, but right. coming online is an incredibly rich set of documents in the form of journals that have gone online. Yeah, yeah. I'm wondering if there's ways of collaborating with the journals to get at those data where you might even have their style sheets, which would help you have an even higher ID yeah. recall. Yeah, no, that's, uh, that's a good point. Um, uh, we have explored some of that just, you know, kind of on the sly. Built, you know, built uh, little engines that are geared specifically to, uh, like Elsevier or whatever. They have a particular way of displaying their documents and how you actually access them. So we reverse engineered that and then s saw how it worked. And it actually worked surprisingly well, even using the existing tool set. We have not explored this with uh, publishers at this point, but I think that's a very good idea. So I see that in your strategy for, for uh, discovering ITG, you've chosen to um, pursue precision over recall. Yes, absolutely. And I saw that you were constraining that by using regular expressions to, to narrow the, 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 the possible um, uh, candidates. Right. But it struck me as, as you had a, a tremendous success by incorporating statistical character language models for these different languages. And it seems like you might be able to incorporate some of the same success by, in ITG identification in the first place. Yeah. 
just by using some more uh, more than regular, regular expressions are a little bit rigid. As, yeah. uh, so it might be nice to be able to see if there was some statistical way of, of finding better candidates and maybe increasing your recall as well. Yeah, one of the things we have explored uh, is specifically use, building uh, statistical models over the gloss line, which is actually uh, kind of a very unique string oftentimes because it has all of these embedded glosses and special characters, and spe I mean, not special characters, but special words, special terms. Um, and uh, that's a strategy that we're using specifically for improving that recall. Yeah. Look for a lot of Kim and. and, and yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, the uh, it's um, yeah. yeah. It's a very good, very good suggestion. Did you have uh, uh, ideas beyond that? Well, uh, it's in uh, the, over the entire plus line. Yeah, but even within the whole document, identifying okay. you know region change is sort of like topic boundary detection. Sure. I mean, there's certainly a fair amount of literature on. The detection of topic change in uh, in any in, in news documents, yeah. uh, for example, and it seems like the relevant is it, it's a related concept where you could do statistical methods to try to identify when is an IT, uh, uh, IGT being introduced, yeah, um, and then use that as a, an extra cue for is this a, a likely candidate? So you're saying, uh, okay, yes, that's a, that's a very good idea. Next around yeah. it would also help you know yeah. that this might be you know interlinear glosses. Yeah, we uh, we've concentrated right. on mining that text, but we haven't concentrated on that as a, a, a topic change kind right. of. Right. I mean, yeah, that's this, a very and good. And the idea. structure right. of, of the example itself is often going to to be statistically interesting. Yeah. It, just, it seems like that you should be able to, uh, you know, if you have a sufficiently large window with the right uh, analysis on it. You should be able to say, it looks like there's about to be a, you know, an IGT here, and yeah. then this one looks like it is in the, you know, you're using some kind of Markov model where you have yeah. you know, before, during, and after kinds of models. It's a very so good idea. Yeah, no, I think that that's a very good idea. I hadn't considered that. Very good. Um, you had mentioned how PDF is a disaster. <laughs> I'm not going to disagree. I'd like to say it's actually more of a structured disaster in terms yeah. of, because obviously it does display fine. It's just somewhere between display and getting stuff out. Right. Um, one thing you can actually try for those cases, because it often stores the glyph IDs that are in fonts. Yes. And the glyph IDs are very regular for those, because it knows what the font is, what the idea is. Yeah. You could be able to work backwards, and the same way that PDF is able to put, a, you know, the same way the document's able to be displayed, you can actually find what the character was supposed to be yeah. that way, instead of using, actually, instead of trying to extract the data you extract the information about how it's what it's displaying, and then yeah. you find, oh, that was actually uh, a diaresis. Right, right. We uh, that's a uh, we have looked at that uh, because you did, you know if it is stored sometimes it uh, it isn't then it's some standard font but uh, so you can go in there and pull those those out. The problem is what's what's an object in the PDF itself is not necessarily an object that we're necessarily looking for. It could be a whole cluster of objects that are not necessarily sequential. So you see what I'm saying? So they could be you know displayed at various po uh, points on the page. And we actually found that to be the most difficult part. Is we found that there were pieces of the IGT that were actually spread about with, and not, uh, not uh, contiguous within the actual PDF doc. We found it very difficult to manipulate. And we finally said, oh, forget about it. And we just moved on. But uh, given what we know now, we could actually, I, I think, take an example and go back. You know, If we found the example, try to find where we think it is within the document and then try to ex uh, do matching between what we've extracted and uh, uh, the instance within the PDF itself. I think that's a little different than what you're suggesting, but uh, <laughs> yeah, structured disaster. Yeah, right, right. Work with it. Yeah. Other questions? I think everyone wants to eat for the demos. Yeah, I don't think I have to point out where the food is, um, but I, I have a little list here of the uh, demos. I just want to remind everybody what's uh, going to be up there. So there's uh, a demo on, um, hang on, I have it somewhere. There we go. So uh, Emily Bender and Scott Dralishek are going to uh, show the grammar matrix. And I think there was a poster actually at, at one of the last symposia. So this time we're, we're going to get uh, uh, going to get a demo of that. Steve Moran has uh, a demo of the email tools, and then um, from the Microsoft side we have uh, from the MSR speech group we have a demo of uh, rapid development of telephony natural speech applications. And then there's also don't forget there's a table over there with uh, you know there's there's an actual job. Uh, 
job opening description over there and there's lots of opportunities for internships and uh, there's going to be people there who can help you out with that and give you additional information. And I think now it's just mix and mingle. So have fun.